This is lecture 5H, and today we're going to talk about state functions. A state function is a property of a system that depends only on the current state of the system, not on the way in which the system acquired that state. And let me demonstrate this to you by, this, by an example. Let's talk about the properties of some car driving trip from Laguna Beach to Big Bear. So on the map, here's Laguna Beach right next to the Pacific Ocean, and then Big Bear is way inland at the very top right on this particular map. So let's talk about a couple of different properties of this car trip. First, let's talk about the car's altitude. So is the car's altitude a state function for this driving trip? Well, what's a state function? It only depends upon the uh, specific state of the car at any given time. So you would need to ask the question, do you know the car's altitude only by knowing its state, which is another way of saying its current position? And the answer for that is actually yes. If you're in your car, you have a little navigation system, you can actually, it'll actually tell you what altitude you're at at any instance anywhere along the trip. So because this is true, we would say the car's altitude is a state function. Let's look at something else. What if I ask you, uh, what's the trip's mileage? Can you actually tell what the trip's mileage is just by knowing the state of the trip, i.e. what position you're in? Can you tell the trip's mileage by only knowing the car's current position? So if you're driving from Laguna Beach to Big Bear and you're right now in Corona, do you know how many miles you've driven? And the answer is actually no. It actually depends how you got from Laguna Beach to Corona. So the pathway is important. If you need to know the pathway to answer the question, then that means this particular property of the car trip is not a state function. So we would say mileage is not a state function of a particular car trip. So what's the significance of a property that is a state function? Well, one important thing is that if a property is a state function, that means the change in that property can be calculated by only knowing the initial state and the final state of the system. And let's apply that to the car trip, okay? Because if the, uh, some property of a car trip is a state function, that means that the property is independent of the pathway. How you get from one point to another doesn't matter. So let's take the example of our car's altitude, which we determined was a state function. That means we should be able to calculate the change in the car's altitude by only knowing where the car started and where it ended up. Its starting location was Laguna Beach. Its ending location is Big Bear. So if you want to calculate the change in the car's altitude, you would go final position minus initial position. So the location at Big Bear minus the location at Laguna Beach. If you know a little bit of California geography, the altitude of Big Bear is 6,752 feet and the altitude at Laguna Beach is zero. It's next to the ocean. If you subtract these, that comes out 6,752. That's the difference in altitude you would have achieved if you went from Laguna Beach to Big Bear. So we can calculate the change in this property by just knowing its initial position and its final position. Now, does that apply to the trip's mileage? Can you tell how many miles you drove going from Laguna Beach to Big Bear just by knowing you started in Laguna Beach and you ended up in Big Bear? On a map, you could take a little ruler and measure the distance between them, but see, that's only going to give you the trip's mileage, the difference in miles there, if you do it as a straight line. That's what happens when you use Google Maps, and it tells you, oh, the McDonald's is only one mile away, and then on the freeway, it's like seven miles because you have to go around all these streets to get to it. So in this case, you can't tell the amount of miles you've driven because it depends upon the path. If you go directly from Laguna Beach to Big Bear, shortest distance might be 90 or 100 miles. But if you drive up to San Francisco, then drive down to San Diego and then go to Big Bear, it'd be like 800 miles. So it does depend upon the pathway. So if you have something that depends upon the pathway, it's not a state function. But anytime you do have a state function, then that property is independent of the pathway. You can determine its numerical value by only knowing its starting position and its ending position. And how that applies to thermochemistry has to do with the concept of enthalpy. Enthalpy, it turns out mathematically, is a state function. So that means we can calculate the change in enthalpy for any process just by knowing its initial state and its final state. The pathway doesn't matter.
So the change in enthalpy is independent of the pathway. And if we apply this to chemistry, it means it's independent of the pathway in which a reaction occurs. So reactants can turn into products in a number of different ways, but what this is saying is that every time that happens, the same enthalpy change will occur. And because enthalpy equals the amount of heat given off or absorbed in a chemical reaction occurring under constant pressure, that really means under most situations, because most of our reactions we do are taking place under a constant atmospheric pressure, that means the heat given off or absorbed in chemical reactions is also independent of the pathway. And we're gonna use the fact that enthalpy is a state function to make predictions about the amount of heat given off or absorbed in chemical reactions. And applying the idea that it's a state function to chemical reactions is called Hess's law. And Hess's law states that the change in the state function of enthalpy, which we abbreviate delta H, of a chemical reaction can be calculated via any process in which the reactants turn into products. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say we're gonna to try to produce sulfonyl chloride, SO2Cl2, and that can be produced from its constituent elements, sulfur plus oxygen plus chlorine. If we do this by first combining the sulfur and oxygen, maybe igniting the sulfur and oxygen together to form SO2, we collect the SO2 gas, then we have the SO2 gas react with chlorine gas, that'll eventually form SO2Cl2. If we add these two different processes together, anything that's the same on the left and the right side of the equation would cancel out, and so the SO2s would cancel out, leaving the overall reaction, the one we have at the very top in white. It would be sulfur plus oxygen plus chlorine yields SO2Cl2. Now, what if we decided to do this in a different way? What if we decided to first combine the sulfur with the chlorine, have them react to form sulfur dichloride? Then we take the sulfur dichloride, react it with oxygen, and have that turn into SO2Cl2. In this case, we have SCl2 on both the left and the right side of these two equations. They would cancel out, but the net overall chemical reaction would still come out the same as it was above. Sulfur plus oxygen plus chlorine yields SO2Cl2. So we're just demonstrating here that chemical reactions can occur in different pathways. And this is two different pathways to form SO2Cl2. Here's the point. If we can use calorimetry to determine the enthalpy change for each one of these processes, and we wanna see if we can determine the enthalpy change for the overall reaction. Let's say when sulfur and oxygen react, exothermic reaction, combustion reaction, we're able to calculate from a calorimeter that the enthalpy change for the combustion of sulfur is negative 180 kilojoules. If we can calculate in a calorimeter the enthalpy change for the SO2 plus the Cl2, we would find that comes out 112. What's the significance of that is, is if you add those together because those reactions add up to make our overall reaction of sulfur plus oxygen plus chlorine yields SO2Cl2, if you add those enthalpy changes together, they will give you the enthalpy change of the overall reaction. So our reaction of sulfur plus oxygen plus chlorine yielding sulfonyl chloride should have an enthalpy change value of negative 68 kilojoules, so it's exothermic by 68 kilojoules. And Hess's law states that the enthalpy change for that reaction will always come out negative 68 kilojoules no matter what the pathway is. If we try our secondary yellow pathway here, and in a calorimeter measure the enthalpy change for the reaction of sulfur with chlorine, this turns out to be exothermic by 60 kilojoules. Then if we calculate the enthalpy change for the SCl2 plus O2 reaction, we would find that comes out negative eight kilojoules. What do these add to make? Exactly the same number as before. So what'll happen is anytime a chemical reaction occurs, when reactants eventually turn into products, the enthalpy change or the heat given off or absorbed will always come out to be the same number, no matter what pathway the reaction occurs in. And as a chemist, if we want to do theoretical work, we can then choose the pathway we want to make reactants turn into products if it will allow us a simple way to calculate the enthalpy change. You've actually done this one time already. In two uh, homework assignments ago, you had to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction from bond energies. So you were using a particular pathway. You were saying all the bonds in the reactant molecules had to break so you became a bunch of atoms. Then you said all those atoms will bond together to form the products. Does that really happen? Probably not. 
but that pathway will give you the same enthalpy change as any other pathway, so that would give you the enthalpy change for a reaction. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at chemical reactions and using Hess's law. And let me give you a couple tips that you'll need to know to use Hess's law. First, if you know the enthalpy change for a given reaction and then you reverse the reaction, the sign of the delta H has to be changed. That's beca because if a reaction in the forward direction is exothermic, if you were to do the reverse reaction by logical deduction, the reverse reaction would have to be endothermic. So if one way the reaction's exothermic, the other's endothermic, the only difference of those for their enthalpy change is their sign. So we reverse the sign. Second, if the coefficients in a balanced equation are multiplied by an integer, then the value of delta H has to be multiplied by that integer as well. And let me show you a couple of examples of this. Let's take this reaction, the reaction of xenon with fluorine to form xenon tetrafluoride. The delta H associated with this reaction is negative 251 kilojoules. Now you should be thinking, wait a second, is 251 kilojoules being given off a lot or a little? And the answer is, I don't know, because that number is not very informative. You need to have that number as kilojoules per mole or kilojoules per gram for somebody to understand what that means. But anytime they write a delta H value next to a balanced chemical equation, they don't write it in kilojoules per mole because that would be ambiguous. If you wrote negative 251 kilojoules per mole, what is that per mole of? The reaction has xenon, fluorine, and xenon tetrafluoride. Because there are different reactants and products and they have different coefficients in the balanced equation, writing per mole would be ambiguous. So heats of reactions next to chemical reactions are not given the units of kilojoules per mole, but what they do is they just leave them in kilojoules so that you can then apply them to the correct number of moles of each of the reactants in the balanced equation. So that negative 251 kilojoules you should think about should be read as negative 251 kilojoules per what's in front of the xenon? One mole of xenon. So therefore it's negative 251 kilojoules per mole of xenon. If you want to apply it to fluorine, you would say that it's negative 251 kilojoules per, what's the coefficient? Two moles of fluorine. That would divide out to be 125.5 kilojoules per mole, but we could write it as negative 251 kilojoules per two moles if you wish, that would be fine. Or if you want to apply it to the product, it's negative 251 kilojoules per, what's the coefficient? One mole of xenon, oh, I wrote xenon difluoride, but that should have been xenon tetrafluoride. So whenever you see a delta H value, enthalpy change value alongside a chemical reaction, it will not have per mole in it. It'll just be in kilojoules, but you can make it per mole of any reactant or product if you just divide it by whatever the coefficient is in front of that particular reactant or product. Now to apply Hess's law. If we know the delta H for this reaction is negative 251 kilojoules, would you be able to determine the delta H for this reaction? If you recognize it's the same reaction as above, only in the reverse direction, that means the energy change is going to be exactly the same, but because it's reversed, it's not going to give off 251 kilojoules. It's going to absorb 251 kilojoules, so you just change the sign. So the delta H for this would be written as 251 kilojoules, but if you wanted to apply it to, let's say, xenon tetrafluoride, you would say, oh, that's 251 kilojoules per one mole of, oh, there's that mistake again, xenon tetrafluoride, it should have been written. Okay, now what would be the enthalpy change for this reaction? I've multiplied the entire reaction by two. So if you multiply the entire reaction by two, the enthalpy change for this reaction has to be multiplied by two as well. 251 times two is 502. Think about why that is. Here in the second reaction, you're reacting away one mole of xenon tetrafluoride. It's going to absorb 251 kilojoules. But if you have to react away two moles of it, that's twice the amount. So it has to absorb twice the amount of heat to do that. That's why it's 502. So when you write a balanced equation, you're telling how many moles of the substance you're saying are reacting away. And if you have a bigger amount, it's going to have a bigger energy value. If you put one log in the fireplace, it's going to give off a certain amount of heat. If you put two logs in the fireplace and burn them, it's going to give off twice the amount of heat. It has to. So that's why this number is 502. But on a per mole basis, watch what happens. If we calculate the delta H from our third reaction 
as kilojoules per mole of xenon tetrafluoride, what would that be? 502 divided by two moles of xenon tetrafluoride. And what's 502 divided by two? That's 251. So the per mole basis always comes out to be the same, but when you write a balanced equation and you put a delta H value next to that, that stands for the amount of substance you've actually reacted away. And if you double the amount of xenon tetrafluoride as we've done from reaction two to three, you have to double the delta H value that goes next to it on the side. So let me show you a, a couple of applications of this. Let's say through a, with a bomb calorimeter, we've measured the heat of combustion of a couple of different substances. If you combust carbon and it turns into CO2, the enthalpy change for this reaction is negative 394 kilojoules. And if you want to be specific, if you want to say negative 349 kilojoules per mole of something, usually we say it per mole of what's being combusted. What's being combusted here? Carbon GER? What does that GER mean? That's one of the allotropes of carbon. That means graphite. So when graphite is burned, it releases 394 kilojoules per mole of graphite. If you burn a different form of carbon allotrope and it turns into CO2, and they don't do this very often because that's an expensive reaction, that enthalpy change turns out to be negative 396 kilojoules per one mole of carbon as, carbon as a diamond burn. So we can actually do those. People have done those reactions actually in calorimeters. But one reaction they've never done in a calorimeter, so we've never seen the delta H value of this experimentally measured, is the enthalpy change for the reaction that changes graphite into diamond. Now, could we calculate that theoretically? Yes, we could using Hess's law. If you take the two reactions I have above, they both have graphite and diamond in them. And in my overall reaction, I need graphite and diamond. The graphite I need on the left side of the equation is a reactant. And my top equation already has carbon as graphite as a reactant. So I'm going to write my first reaction because it has one mole of graphite as a reactant. What's the delta H of this reaction the way it's written? It's negative 394 kilojoules. Here comes the important part now. You want your new reaction that you don't know the delta H for to have one mole of diamond on the product side. What reaction has diamond in it that you know a delta H for? The second one but that one mole of diamond is on the wrong side of the equation. What do you have to do with this equation? You have to reverse it. If you reverse that equation, go CO2 yielding diamond plus oxygen, we now have diamond on the product side. What's the delta H for that reaction? We've reversed it so it switches from exothermic to endothermic, you change the sign, it's 396. Now, if we've done this correctly, watch what happens. Before we add these together, is there anything the same on the left and the right side? Yes, there's one mole of oxygen on the left and the right, cancel those out. And there's one mole of carbon dioxide on the left and the right, cancel those out. What's left over? Graphite goes to diamond. So if these two reactions add up to make the one we want, graphite turning to diamond, all I have to do is add the two delta H values for those, and that will be the delta H value for the reaction of graphite turning into diamond, and we know that's what it is, even though we've never done that reaction in history. Now, if you want to graph an energy change, and we'll see more and more of this as we progress throughout general chemistry and even into organic chemistry, if we write a reaction coordinate on the x-axis, which essentially means reactants on the left and products on the right, and we graph their energy, graphite has a certain amount of energy content in it, and if we know the delta H of the reaction is positive two kilojoules, that means the graphite has to absorb two kilojoules worth of energy to cause it to turn into diamond. That means diamond's energy state is two kilojoules higher than graphite. So if I can put a diamond on there at two, because that's two higher than zero, then the difference in those two levels is the enthalpy change of the reaction. Okay, that seems fairly low. And so it may wonder to some people, how come diamonds, uh, which are in lots of people's rings and jewelry, don't just over time turn into graphite because graphite has a lower energy state. We spent a good deal of time talking about why hydrogen atoms don't exist as hydrogen atoms naturally. They bond together to form diatomic molecules. That's because the diatomic molecules are more stable, their energy state is lower. So why doesn't diamond turn into graphite spontaneously? Because technically graphite is more stable than diamond. 
Well, the reason has to do with another aspect of chemistry called kinetics. And kinetics deals with how a reaction occurs. If you want to go from graphite to diamond or diamond to graphite, what is the pathway? And that pathway is going to require a certain amount of energy. And it turns out that amount of energy is really, really high. That's why the only time you've ever seen graphite turn into diamond is if you've watched any old Superman movies and he picks up a chunk of coal, which is graphite essentially, and crushes it in his superhuman strength hands. And that high pressure is able to overcome the energy barrier for this reaction. That energy barrier called the activation energy is the energy that's needed to either turn graphite into diamond or diamond into graphite. Most reactions have a barrier like this. If you remember the experiment where I uh, had zinc and sulfur mixed together in an evaporating dish and nothing happened, but I took the Bunsen burner flame and I held the Bunsen burner flame on it for like 15 seconds, all of a sudden the reaction occurred. That's because the Bunsen burner applied the activation energy needed and the reactants turned into products. Now that activation energy is not as high as this one. This is really, really high. So that's why all the diamonds in your rings and earrings and stuff are, are pretty much safe. Okay. But that's a whole realm of chemistry called kinetics. Thermodynamics or thermochemistry only deals with initial states and final states. So we won't talk about how reactions occur until into Chem 1B. Let's try another example, a little bit more complex one. Let me give you the delta H's of three different reactions. First, the reaction of ozone turning into oxygen, delta H value, negative 428 kilojoules. The reaction of a diatomic oxygen molecule breaking into two oxygen atoms, delta H for that, positive 496. And then for the reaction of nitrogen monoxide with ozone turning into nitrogen dioxide and oxygen, the delta H for that is negative 199 kilojoules. If we know the delta H's for those three reactions, we're going to see if we can use them and Hess's law to calculate the delta H for the reaction, NO plus O yields NO2. To do this, same technique as before. I want to get one mole of NO on the reactant side, one mole of O on the reactant side, and I want to get one mole of NO2 on the product side. How do I get one mole of NO on the reactant side from three reactions that I know their delta H is for? Well, I look for where NO is. So to get the one NO on the left side of the equation, I find it in the reactions that are given to me. And here's the NO right there. So I'm going to take that third reaction. I'm going to write it exactly how it's written because that's going to produce one mole of NO as a reactant. Now, as a bonus for that one, we also need one mole of NO2 on the product side. And that third reaction already has one mole of NO2 on the product side. So that third reaction is really, really helpful. So if I write that down, I have the one mole of NO on the reactant side, the one mole of NO2 on the product side, and <clears throat> that will actually get two thirds of the problem done. Delta H for that reaction, just from above negative 199 kilojoules. The only thing that's missing now is the O. Monatomic oxygen is different than ozone or diatomic oxygen. The only place that monatomic oxygen appears in the given three reactions is the middle one. Two things are wrong though. First, it's on the wrong side of the equation, so this reaction must be reversed. And if I reverse it, I'm gonna change this to negative 496. The second thing that's wrong is that says two moles of O, but I only need one mole of O. So this reaction also needs to be multiplied by one half. And if I multiply by one half, I'm gonna multiply the delta H by one half as well. So if I reverse it, so it goes 2O goes to O2, and then multiply it by one half, I'm going to wind up getting one mole of O on my reactant side. And so the one, if I divide that middle reaction by two and reverse it, I'm going to get one mole of O yielding a half a mole of O2. In a lot of these reactions, you're going to see fractions, and fractions are okay because we're going to be thinking of this as a half a mole of oxygen, not a half a mole of an ox not a half an oxygen molecule. So if I reverse the reaction number two, it changed to negative 496, and if I multiply it by one half, it gets multiplied in half or by one half to become negative 248. So this second reaction now gives us the final ingredient in our reaction. We now have an NO and an O and an NO2. If everything else cancels out, we're done. But in this case, unfortunately, the left side has an extraneous ozone molecule and the right side has one and a half O2 molecules. So they don't cancel out. They may balance, but they don't cancel out. They're not the same thing. 
So I need to add one more reaction to this in order to try to cancel all those out. If you pick maybe the easiest member of this group, maybe the O3, and go, how could I cancel out an O3? Look at the one remaining reaction we've had, the first one. It has O3 in it. So if I want the O3 down here to cancel out, I'm going to need to put the O3 on the product side. This reaction needs to be reversed, so the delta H becomes positive 428. And what else do I have to do? This says 2, and I only need 1. Multiply it by 1 half. So if I reverse the reaction and multiply it by 1 half, reversing it would put the O2s on the left, the O3s on the right, and multiplying it by 1 half, 3 times a half would be 1 and a half, 2 times 1 half would be 1. Now I'll wind up having a single O3 on the right side, which will cancel out the single O3 on the left, and hopefully everything else is going to cancel out as well. So reversing the reaction changes the delta H to positive 428, and dividing it by 2 or multiplying it by 1 half changes it to 214. Now, did this work? The O3s canceled out. What about the O2s? I have one and a half O2s on the left, and on the right side, I have a half of O2 and one O2, and a half plus one is one and a half. Those all cancel out. This yields the overall reaction NO plus O yields NO2, and based upon the fact that the enthalpy change is a state function, all I have to do is add up the delta H's for those three individual steps, and I'm going to get the delta H for the overall reaction, which comes out to be exothermic to 233 kilojoules. Now, we're going to eventually start using some data that's found on handout 9, and handout 9 has enthalpy changes for specific types of reactions. They're called formation reactions, and here, before we're done today, we've got to learn what a formation reaction is. A formation reaction is a chemical reaction that forms one mole of a pure substance from the elements that compose it. And what we're going to do is we're going to write a couple of formation reactions to try to practice how this is and what they look like. So if you want to write the formation reaction for NO2 gas, that means that you want the reaction that forms NO2 gas, and specifically, you want it to form one mole of NO2 gas. What are the reactants? Read the definition. The elements that compose it. What elements compose NO2? Nitrogen and oxygen. How do nitrogen and oxygen exist naturally on Earth? As N2 gas and O2 gas. So the reactants will be N2 plus O2. To balance the equation, because we only are going to form one NO2 molecule on the product side, and I have an N2 on the left side, I'm going to have to multiply the N2 by one half. So this says one half mole of N2 gas plus one mole of O2 gas will produce what's required in a formation reaction, the product one mole of NO2. So formation reactions always make one mole of the substance, so quite often on the reactant side where the elemental materials are, you may have to use fractional coefficients to get that to balance. Let's try again. Let's write the formation reaction for CH3OH. A formation reaction forms one mole of that substance, so we're going to form one mole of CH3OH. What does it get formed from? CH3 and OH. No, those aren't elements. There's only 118 chemical elements that exist, matter that cannot be decomposed, and they're found on the periodic table. And in this compound, there are three of those, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So therefore, the formation reaction is the one that creates this compound methanol from the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Carbon is usually written in a reaction as C, hydrogen is diatomic, H2, and oxygen is diatomic, H2. Oxygen is diatomic O2. So for the carbons to balance, we would need one carbon. For the hydrogens to balance, because there's four hydrogens in our product, we would need two H2s. And for the oxygens to balance, because there's only one O in the product, we would need one half a mole of O2 gas. If that makes sense, why don't you take a moment, see if you can write the formation reaction for lithium fluoride, and I'll just pause here, and then we'll see if you get the answer correct. So the reaction should be forming one mole of lithium fluoride from the elements that make it up. The elements that make it up are lithium and fluorine. Lithium exists as a metal. Individual atoms are how we write that, so Li. Fluorine is one of the diatomic elements, so it'd be written F2. And to balance the equation, you would need one half mole of F2 in order to have that equation balanced. 
So these are formation reactions. And eventually when we get to handout nine, what you're gonna see is handout nine is gonna give you enthalpy changes for formation reactions. And to indicate that the, the uh, enthalpy change is specifically for a formation reaction, they write the symbol of that as delta H subscript F. And they're called enthalpy of formations. They're just the enthalpy change for a formation reaction. And because the change in enthalpy is also equal to the amount of heat given off or absorbed when a process occurs, they're sometimes called heat of formations as well. Both names are fine. Now, for the data that's in handout nine that we're gonna be using, those enthalpy of formations or those heat of formations have all been calculated assuming some uh, specifics about the reactants and products. So heat of formations are calculated assuming the following conditions, and these will be true for all the values calculated in table nine. First, any gaseous reactants or products, their pressures were one atmosphere pressure when the reaction occurred. Second, if you have reactants or products that are in the dissolved state, their concentrations were one molar when the uh, delta H's were calculated for those processes. Third, if you have an elemental substance in the reaction, which we will for all of the formation reactions, then we'll assume those elements are in their natural state at room temperature and pressure. That's why we had oxygen as O2, carbon as a solid, and hydrogen as H2 gas. If all the reactants and products meet these criteria, we say they're under standard state conditions. So reactants and products under these conditions are said to be in their standard states. So more specifically, the data that you're using from handout nine that we're gonna start with on our, our next lecture, those are all gonna be enthalpy of formations when the reactants and products are in their standard states. So they actually name the enthalpy of formation a little bit more specifically. They call it the standard enthalpy of formation and they indicate standard state with a right superscript not after the delta H, looks like a degree sign. So standard enthalpy of formation, delta H not sub F, is the enthalpy change for a formation reaction when the reactants and products are in their standard states. And because this is equal to the amount of heat given off or absorbed when the reaction occurs, they're also known as standard heat of formations. So when we go to handout nine, you're gonna see there's tons and tons of different substances that have standard heat of formations listed. For example, we talked about NO2 a little bit earlier. You can look up NO2 gas on that table and it will say right next to it, standard heat of formation, 34 kilojoules per mole. It'll say for methanol, standard heat of formation, negative 239 kilojoules per mole. The table doesn't give you the reaction. It just says for NO2, the heat of formation is 34. You need to know it's 34 kilojoules are absorbed per mole of NO2 that's formed from a half a mole of nitrogen plus one mole of oxygen. So you'll need to know the reaction it corresponds to. They don't give it to you. You can look up almost anything in the table we're gonna be using. It says the standard heat of formation of oxygen is zero. That's kind of weird. I wonder why it's zero. Let's think about what chemical reaction that would be. The formation reaction is the reaction that forms one mole of the substance from its elements in its standard state. So we're gonna form one mole of O2 from the only element in there, which is oxygen, which exists naturally as O2. So how much energy would it take to convert O2 gas into O2 gas? Oh, the answer is none. So moral of the story is anytime you have an element that's in its standard state, if you look it up on the table handout nine and you're looking for its standard heat of formation, it's always gonna be a value of zero because the reaction is always itself turning into itself. We talked about the standard, uh, the, rather the formation reaction of lithium fluoride earlier, and you could look that up in the table as well. Its standard heat of formation is negative 617. So one last thing about the tables before uh, we finish today, I want you to understand where those numbers come from because you actually can't take carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, put it in a calorimeter, light it on fire, and have it turn into CH3OH, and then we measure negative 239 kilojoules per mole. Most of those numbers are calculated theoretically and let me show you how that's done. I'm gonna show you how you theoretically calculate the standard heat of formation of let's say the lithium fluoride solid. So that would be the reaction forming one mole of lithium fluoride from the elements that make it up, which is elemental lithium and then a half a mole of diatomic elemental fluorine. Now, 
To do this, we're going to use a bunch of data that we've talked about earlier in the semester. And the first bit of data I'm going to talk about is a heat of sublimation. What did sublimation mean? That's when a substance turns from a solid directly to a gas. So for lithium, you can actually measure in lab how much energy it takes to turn solid lithium into gaseous lithium. And that energy change is its heat of sublimation. It's a positive number because it's endothermic. Solid has to absorb heat to turn into a gas. Now, what this does is this allows us to get one mole of lithium on the reactant side of an overall equation because we're trying to get a bunch of reactions that we know their delta H is for to equal the reaction at the very top. So if I use the heat of sublimation, that gives me one mole of lithium on the reactant side, which is exactly what I want in the overall equation. Something else we're going to use is the bond energy of a diatomic fluorine molecule. Two fluorine atoms bond together to make a single bond, and the bond energy is the energy needed to break that bond. And that's an endothermic value. That's why it's positive 154. So that's technically the energy needed to take one mole of diatomic fluorine molecules and break each of the bonds to turn them into two moles of monatomic fluorine. We need this because we have fluorine as a reactant in our overall equation. The problem is our overall equation at the top has a half a mole of fluorine, and this bond energy is breaking apart the bonds in one mole of fluorine. So I'm going to have to take that bond energy, and I'm going to have to multiply it by one half. So I have a balanced equation, one half mole of fluorine yields one mole of atomic fluorine. So if I erase that, multiply by one half, then I also multiply the bond energy by one half. So if you're going to break the bonds in a half a mole of fluorine, then you're going to wind up having a bond energy for that of 77 kilojoules. Why do we do that? Because I need this one half mole of fluorine on the reactant side, and this gives me one half mole of fluorine on the reactant side as well. Okay? Now, <clears throat> we have one more thing to go. We have our product, lithium fluoride. And we can get lithium fluoride on the product side by measuring what's called its lattice energy. This is the energy that's released when positive and negative ions stick together to form an ionic crystal. And to show that the lithium and the fluoride ions are independent to start, they can't be in the solid state, they can't be in the liquid state, they're not aqueous, they're gaseous. So lattice energy is actually the energy for two gaseous ions of opposite charge to stick together and form an ionic compound. And if I write the lattice energy, that's going to give me one mole of lithium fluoride on the product side, which exactly matches what I need in the overall equation. So by using these three, I can get one mole of lithium plus a half a mole of fluorine turning into LIF. I just add those three numbers together. Unfortunately, there's a few things left over. I've got some gaseous lithium, I've got gaseous monoatomic fluorine, and I've got lithium ions and fluoride ions that are gaseous. So those have to be removed. So I need a couple of other things before I actually get to the uh, heat of formation for the above reaction. The first thing I'm going to use to do that, because now I have these three, they're all perfect, but everything else left over in the equation has to be canceled out. So what I'm going to cancel them out is by using first the first ionization energy of lithium. Go back to test one. What's ionization energy? The energy needed to pull an electron off of a gaseous atom. The first ionization energy is the energy needed to pull one electron off of a lithium atom. So that would be a lithium atom gaseous state turning into a lithium ion and an electron. If I use that, that causes the gaseous lithium atoms to cancel out. It causes the gaseous lithium ions to cancel out. And now I'm closer to the overall reaction. One more thing I need is I need the first electron affinity of fluorine. This is the energy change when an atom gains an electron. So when an atomic fluorine atom gains an electron, it turns into a fluoride ion, releasing 328 kilojoules. This makes the fluorine monatomic atoms that are gaseous cancel out. It makes the fluoride ions cancel out. It makes the electrons cancel out. And now all that's left over is Li solid plus one half F2 gas yields LiF solid. So if I get the overall reaction by adding these five individual reactions together, all I have to do is add up their enthalpy changes, and that's going to give me the delta H for my reaction, which is the standard heat of formation of lithium fluoride. And this is where almost all of the standard heat of formations in uh, handout nine are calculated from. 